offers us some interesting issues. First of all, we'll take a look at our relief valve sensing line, which comes through a street L on the bottom. We know that, that uh, O-ring seals it into the body here. Let's go ahead and take the relief valve apart. Go ahead and remove the cover. There will not be spring tension coming up from the inside when you take the cover off. But what you'll see is a rolling diaphragm like this that we have to pull out gingerly. I say gingerly because it is actually glued to the piece below it, which I'll show you in just a second. I'm going to go ahead and take this apart and show you all the individual pieces. Then we're going to see how it works. Then we're going to put it back together and take it apart for a repair. So once I've pulled that rolling diaphragm out, now I'm going to squeeze from the back side, pulling the stem out, and have it come out in one piece like this. I have my relief valve body, my stem assembly, which has a rolling diaphragm support, my rolling diaphragm, which is glued to my rolling diaphragm retainer. I have a large 15 16 stainless steel nut. So what do I need? A full impact wrench to remove that? No, it should only be hand tight. So if it's hand tight again, we know that there should be an O-ring seal underneath. So go ahead and unscrew this. I'm going to remove rolling diaphragm and it attached glue there to my spring. This very funny looking washer, which we'll talk about in a second. This bolt has an O-ring on the back side, which you see here. Go ahead and loosen the bolt. There is a second O-ring on this side right there. Okay, so let's see how does it work. When we were talking earlier about the construction of relief valves, we had our three little things we were worried about. We want to know about the trip ratio. We want to know about the type of elastic element. And we want to know if it's hydraulically balanced or not. So how does this one work? Put this back together. Here's my relief valve body, and here's what it would look like inside there. My relief valve cover would be coming here. So my high-pressure sensing line would be attached to this cover. So my high pressure comes in here which causes the relief valve to close like this. Now, this area here where the relief valve discharge, again, normally it's going to be like this, but I'm just having it in this position to show you for the repair purposes. This would be my relief valve discharge, which is open to atmosphere. In other words, there's no water, no pressure in this area. High pressure sits on this side of the elastic element. My low pressure coming past the first check now butts up against my relief valve disc. So it's a non-hydraulically balanced relief valve. There is no water to assist the low pressure side of my elastic element. As we said earlier, the only thing I get my additional load from is the heavier load on the spring. So this area is open to atmosphere, which is important because that means it's sitting over here. Anybody puts grease or anything along here, what happens to grease when you leave it sitting out? It'll dry, it'll cake across here and cause the relief valve not to open. So it's non-hydraulically balanced. Sense, um, hydraulic sensing line on the cover, we mentioned that. The other one I want to talk about was the trip ratio. And we talked the trip ratio is the effective area of the elastic element. In this case, we have a rolling diaphragm versus the disc. Kind of pretty close to almost about one and a half to one, isn't it? Much different than we saw in the fabricated steel design. So we have a lower trip ratio. Then we also have a rolling diaphragm. In this case, we have an extremely sharp folded rolling diaphragm. So those are those three things we were worried about, trip ratio, rolling diaphragm, and whether it's hydraulically balanced or not. This has all three of those issues. Does that mean it's not as good a relief valve? No, just the opposite. It's one of the more reliable relief valves when it's rebuilt properly. All of these three issues are important concerns when we're rebuilding the assembly that we have to be aware of. So when we go to put this together, my repair technique becomes critical. And that's what's important on this assembly is not so much how it was constructed or built, but how I put it back together. Because how I put it back together has a lot to do with how it functions. Okay, so let's take a look at how this sits inside the assembly. And why did I say that was important? Because remember, it would be sitting in there. Remember I said you wanted to feel around the outside? You can see that if this was squeezed or crushed by a pipe wrench, it would not move through there. That's why the first thing I wanted to do was wipe my hand across there, I said, before I took it apart. If I did feel this crushed in or I felt pipe wrench marks on there, before I went any farther, I'd stop my repair and go buy a relief valve body and come back. Because I know if this is dent or bam damaged or has indentations in it, there is a good chance that the relief valve may not slide through that body at that point. So that's why it was critical to inspect it. <clears throat> there are two very important things inside this body. First is right here where my finger is. That's the relief valve seat. That's where that disc actually seals inside the relief valve body. Okay? There is a second slot right back here. It's about an inch back farther. That second slot is what holds this funny looking washer as I called it. What is that washer inside there? If you'll notice, that's how that relief valve moves up and down. 
That's my guide mechanism. And remember what we said the most important part of every component is? The guide. So that washer sits at that secondary slot right here, holds that relief valve here, and as it goes to close, as the high pressure line comes in, it causes the stem to move down. My diaphragm rolls like that. When the relief valve has to open, it pulls up. Again, the rolling diaphragm rolls up. So that's the action of that washer is, is my guide as it moves up and down like that. Okay? So, rebuilding it. As I said, we're going to take the stem, comes out in one piece. Again, we had this gingerly pulled out. As we pulled it out, <coughs> fold our rolling diaphragm inside. Unscrew that bolt, as we said. When you buy the rubber repair kit, this whole piece comes in one piece, glued to it, just like you see that. And that's nice because it makes it a lot easier to rebuild it. We're going to have our two O-rings and our relief valve disc, like this. So, go ahead and change my disc. Put my O-ring on, make sure I grease it before I put it on. Now, whenever you, the disc holder has a female thread and the bolt has a male thread. So when I go to tighten these in, I have to thread that bolt all the way in. There's a corresponding another thread on the rolling diaphragm support that I'm going to attach it to. Whenever you have two threads that you're trying to attach, especially when you have two different O-rings, it's critical that you load each O-ring separately. In other words, I have this O-ring here, this O-ring here, Sometimes people are in a hurry, they just tighten them all up, and I say, okay, I'll just tighten them all together and tighten them up. And if you do that, unfortunately, as you can see here, it is possible to leave a small gap. Obviously, I'm exaggerating the gap because that's a relatively large gap. But it's important when we go to tighten this that we do one O-ring at a time. Load the first O-ring on the bolt. Again, it only has to be hand tight. Small little crescent wrench, make sure we have that tight. Lubricate the O-ring, second O-ring goes on. Now, once I have the second O-ring on, my guide is going to go over here, my relief valve spring. Now, it's important when I put my guide over the spring that I compress the spring to assure the guide slides over here easily because that exposes the thread so I can easily tighten this on and, and go ahead and load my O-ring. If I leave it compressed like that, you can tighten it. and You may have that resistance from the spring, which may not allow you to tighten that properly. Also, if you're not careful, and I'll exaggerate it again, you can tighten it, and suddenly you'll have the guide off to one side. In other words, slightly cocked to one side. Now the relief valve can't move easily. So when you go to tighten that bolt on, pull the guide and the relief valve spring down. Go ahead and tighten this. Get your small adjustable wrench. Tighten that bolt, making sure the second O-ring is loaded. Now, we have to fold this rolling diaphragm into that uh, shape. and has to sit inside our rolling diaphragm support. So you can see that it is possible to fold it down through the middle, which is relatively hard. There's a much easier way to fold this into that shape, and that's to use the air that's inside this cup to compress it into the body. Now, what you're going to do is, first of all, let's go back and talk about the body. I mentioned that O-rings only have to be hand tight. You saw that this was a two-inch thread, and we had four very small little bolts holding that. If this was a two-inch piece of pipe, would four bolts hold enough pressure to seal that? Of course not. That's why we know there had to be some kind of an O-ring seal. We all know O-rings have to have a slot. There's our slot. Where's our O-ring? It's molded on the back side of our rolling diaphragm. So I'm going to use the properties of this O-ring to help me fold this rolling diaphragm into the retainer. So what I'm going to do is back this support back up against that O-ring. And by placing it up against it, I'm going to take my hand, cup it like this, and make sure, move it all the way around 360 degrees, that I'm pushing down on that O-ring so it's sealing on the top. I've trapped the air in this upper portion at this point. So now that I've trapped the air up here, holding it down, I'm going to push down slowly. And as I push slowly, I'll feel the resistance of that air. And what I'm doing is I'm allowing the air to fold that rolling diaphragm into the place, into a slot like this. Instead of sticking something sharp in there, like a screwdriver trying to push the diaphragm, which could cut through it, uh, it allows me to do this. So that's an easy way to do it. Sometimes on a cold day, you have trouble getting the air to do that so you can fill it up with water and achieve the same basic function if you're in a very very cold area and that water will push that through sometimes if air won't bend properly in, in a cold environment so anyway that's the important part with this is getting that roll and the way you get the roll is work the hand around lock the air in pushing it down slowly allowing the air to roll that rolling diaphragm into the place like this now what I want to do is inspect along the outside here. I want to make sure that I don't see any pieces of rubber stuck up because if the rubber is pulled up like this or if the rubber is folded like that, 
where you'll see a little ridge there. It's not a proper rolled diaphragm. Remember, we talked earlier about a rolling diaphragm. The critical thing about a rolling diaphragm is its shape. It's a fabulous piece of equipment that works great as long as it's put back together correctly. If I have it ruptured, you know, bent like this, or I have it ruptured because I cut it with an, a screwdriver, or it's twisted, the rolling diaphragm will not roll properly. So absolutely critical to make sure we put it back together that we get that roll all the way in. On our rolling diaphragm retainer, there is a smooth side and a lipped side. The lip side has to go on the top like this, so underneath that rolling diaphragm. So back to this, let's get it back together. And this is a good thing to practice before you have to go out and do this in the field because sometimes that roll doesn't work the first time. There's a good example. It did not work there. See how it folded out of the cover right there? So I don't have that folded properly. It's not going to work. So I start again. Get my O-ring locked in place. Lock the air. Go ahead and squeeze it down. Slowly pushing down, letting the air force the rolling diaphragm in place. And that's how you got to do it. So practicing is important with this. And this is a very easy thing to do um, outside of the repair. If you've got an extra one at, at the shop, that's a great thing to do. If not, before you put it together, take a little time and do it once or twice, just like this, because it'll help you in the long run making sure you've got it folded properly. All right, now reinserting it back in the body. We're not out of harm's way yet. Relief valve body, I'm going to take it and insert it in upwards like this, making sure it stays in that fashion where I can see the roll. Now once it's pushed back into the body, now I can inspect to make sure my roll is properly. In other words, before all I could do was look on the edge and hoped it was all the way in. Now I can compress it all the way down and look all the way down to the bottom. Now I'm able to get in there and see that that roll goes all the way down and it moves smoothly. This stem should move very easily. Just with one little finger like that, this stem should move up and down. If I hear a lot of grinding action or something causing it so it doesn't move, it tells me something's binding. Remember that washer, that guide, if it was cocked to one side or the other, it would cause my relief valve to not move easily. So it's critical that I make sure it moves easily. I can see my disc close against my seat. In essence, I am testing my relief valve by closing it in that fashion. Now, taking the relief valve cover back on, you'll notice that there are four spaced bolts all the way around it. So equally spaced. So if I go ahead and tighten these four bolts on now, this street out could be pushing off in any direction. In other words, I tighten it here, tighten it here, it moves all the way around. It's important that we go to put this back into the body that that street out end in the location of where my sensing line was. So what you want to do before you take it apart, which I forgot to mention earlier, is go ahead and mark these two flanges. In other words, by marking those two flanges, I know exactly where that street L is sitting so that I can connect up my relief valve sensing line. People say, what does it matter? I'll just turn that sensing line. I'll just turn that street L. You do not want to turn this street L. Because look what happens. Let's say I was off by a quarter turn, and all of a sudden I tighten that street L another quarter turn. Look what's sticking out the back side. That thread goes all the way through that flange, and what's it going to be pushing on? right on my rolling diaphragm. So if you're not sure, go ahead and put the body in first. Get that tight and then figure out where your relief valve sensing line goes. If you didn't mark it, now you can make sure that the, the cover is in the right location to hook up to your relief valve sensing line. Again, quarter turn tight is all it's going to take. Something like a good six inch screwdriver, as I mentioned earlier, across two of the bolts. Give it a quarter turn is all it should take because there's the O-ring on the back side of that uh, rolling diaphragm. Reattach my relief valve sensing line. Now I'm ready to put it back together. Okay. Now it becomes the issue of putting the, the gasket back on the top of my sensing line. I'm going to take this relief valve off for just a minute because it'll sit easier. So now I've got to get my gasket on the top here. What a groove coupling is, it's a, something that's used very extensively in the fire business and starting to show up more and more manufacturers because it's an easily compressible gasket that seals kind of similar to an O-ring without the problems of a gasket. Now, the way it works is it's called a grooved coupling because the groove coupling has two basic places that it holds on. One is the groove in the pipe that you see here like this. The second groove it holds is the cover, which sits under the lip like this. 
So that shows you how that this grabs this slot, which is pushed into the tubing, and the outer one, which holds the cover on top. And the gasket sits in the middle of it, just like that. So that's why you can get that great sealing action with two relatively small bolts with the gasket. But because it's not a common item in the, in the uh, plumbing and or waterworks industry, I want to make sure I take a minute to show you how these gaskets operate. Because if you've never done one, you don't want to make a mistake the first time. Because if you don't put it back together correctly where the groove is not completely clamped, they can blow off through the top. So be very, very careful. So first thing you want to do is put the gasket so that it's flush to the top of the body. Light application of lubricant on the outside is not a bad idea. It helps it squeeze into the body similar to an O-ring. Now I'm going to go ahead and put the cover on, moving the gasket up against the cover at this point. So now my gasket's going to come up, and I'm going to put it on the lip of my cover. I want to make sure the gasket is square on the top and the bottom, like this, square to the cover, just like this. Now I know it's flat here and flat on the top. By taking the two halves of my groove coupling, I'm going to place one and push all the way in, corresponding second side like this. And it should squeeze together so that I can go ahead and catch that bolt, just like that. Once I have the one side caught, now squeezing the other side. Same story. I'll go ahead and get my clamp bolt tightened on just like this. Now it's important when you go to tighten this that this piece has to bottom out here. Go ahead and tighten it so that the two pieces of the coupling come all the way together. You leave it like this, there's only a couple points that are holding into that groove. It has to go all the way down, completely compressed. You get the idea where there's no gap between here. So when you tighten it, there should be no gap between these two pieces like you see here. So that means this has to be tightened a lot more to get that gap to go away. Only when it's completely butted up against these two sides will this provide a blow-off proof seal So on that check cover like that. Again, relief valve sensing line, I took that off so you can see the cover. That's the 4000 SS in the 2.5 through 6 inch size. As I said on the SS design, here's the 2.5 through 4 inch, here's the 6 inch check. Basically, same construction technique, just a larger check assembly, again, O-ring seal. I want to talk a little bit different about the 8 and 10 inch check assembly. So the 2.5 through 6 inch you've seen, and of course we talked about the SE, meaning the downsized version. In other words, this would fit a 6 inch SS, this would fit a 6 inch SE, which is the 4 inch parts. But when you get to the 8 and 10 inch parts, just as you can imagine, the parts do get dramatically bigger. And I want to talk about the dramatically bigger parts for a minute because, unfortunately, with dramatically bigger becomes a few problems that if you're not careful, you can have an injury. So, first thing I want to talk about is the maintenance manual for this particular design. Ames does put out a maintenance manual for their units. On the 8 and 10 inch, I highly, well, on all sizes, I highly suggest you get the maintenance manual. But I wanted to show you what the maintenance manual looked like on the 8 and 10 inch. Here's the one for the second check, and here's the one for the first check. Highly suggest you read it. There are special tools needed to fix the first check. You're going to need two pieces of all-thread rod, 3 8 thick, about 10 inches long, and some nuts. It'll explain that there. But I wanted you to see this is what the maintenance procedures look like for that 8 and 10 inch check design. And I highly recommend on this one more than any other that you do have that before you go ahead and repair it. This is what the second check of a RP would look like, or it would be the first and second check on a double check. It is bolted into the body. It's sealed with an O-ring, just like the other design, but instead of the threads in the back of the body threading in, like on the 2.5 through 6, you'll notice that we have these bolts through here that it attaches to the body. So looking down through the same groove coupling, you're going to see the four bolts here. Remove the bolts. The check assembly will come out in one piece like this. Here's where the O-ring seal is. Same things we talked about O-ring, make sure it's lubricated properly, we put it back together. But getting this apart, we want to make sure, <laughs> you can obviously you can get the horizontal cam arm because of the bolts, you don't have to worry about it like you do with the smaller ones. But to get this apart, we're going to need to release the spring tension. Now this is what's called a torsion spring, kind of similar to the garage where it, or where it gets its tension from twisting that spring mechanism. So we have to release the spring tension in order to get this to rotate to get the disc holder. You'll need a small piece of a quarter inch tubing. I use stainless steel for strength. I know some people say a hollow nut driver will go over here, but you can see what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be placing it over this spring piece that's sticking straight up. It's sticking up an inch and a half on purpose because I want to use that to my 
leverage to get ahead and pull the spring down, push it to the side, and release the spring tension. So what I did is I pulled it sideways and then released it down. There's a small little notch that it sits in right here, as you can see. Show you again, because you have to do it on both sides. Pull it down, push to the side, release the spring tension. Now I've released the spring tension off that torsion spring. Now I can go ahead and open up my disc holder and get at my disc. Now, on the 8 through 10 inch, unlike the 2.5 through 4 and the 6 inch, the disc can be replaced in the field. In order to rebuild this disc, I have to unscrew this disc holder plate. If you have your uh, retainer clip from the fabricated steel design, it fits right inside here. Or you can take 3 3 8 bolts in there, something like this, and go ahead and use that. And this plate will unscrew, allow you to put the new disc inside it. Once you've got the new disc in, tighten your plate back on. Reassembling is going to be just the reverse. Go ahead and loading your spring is going to be similar to unloading it, grabbing it, pulling up, and loading it into the lock. Same on the second arm, pull over, load into the lock. Now you have your spring tension loaded back on the back side. Putting it into the body, make sure your O-ring sits into its recess and bolt in accordingly. Because there are four bolts and it's an O-ring seal, we have to make very, very careful that when we go to tighten these bolts, that we tighten them evenly. Put the four bolts in hand tight and then tighten opposite sides, making sure we don't over tighten one side or the other. Or what will happen is, is it won't be sitting square and it may leak. So that's how we rebuild the check assembly from the double check. It's also the same that shows us the second check of the RP version in the 8 and 10 inch. Well, the second check we saw now for the first check. First check offers a lot of differences. In fact, let's take a look at both checks together. From the back side, they look very similar. The disc holder is the same. The seat's the same. The mounting bracket here that has the has no spring on it. Here's where it has, mounts the um, spring and the cam for the number two check. So the second check is a pivot style check, but the first check is a standard poppet style check where the disc comes out, compresses the spring as it goes in. So the parts are semi-similar. Obviously, the spring loads are dramatically different, but you'll see they use some of the same parts from the double check check assembly than they do on the uh, first and second check. The spring mechanism just bolts on to the, the seat, like you can see here, and sits inside the assembly. So this is the first check. Water is flowing this way, so this is in line. Number one gate valve would be here. So water flows into it. Second check would be sitting inside the body, similar to that. So we've done the second check. Now let's do the first check. This is one of the repair parts that I highly encourage you to read the repair manual. And why I say that, because this spring load is rather severe in the way that it has to be re not contained for the average repair. It's not released, but it's contained. And the way it's contained is with two 3 8 all-thread rods. You can see the picture of those two rods sticking in the picture with two double nuts. And what it suggests is that you have a piece of all-thread approximately 14 inches long, 3 8 all-thread. I'll show you how that works, but I want you to make sure if you get a chance, please be sure to read the repair section on the first check of this assembly so that you do repair it properly without damaging the parts or yourself. So the first thing you're going to notice on the spring retainer, there are four holes in the top, top of the spring. And if you look down at the base, there's a corresponding two nuts, I mean two uh, female slots for the all thread, right there. So right there you'll see where that all thread sits down. So you need two pieces of all thread. It's best to have a double nut on them because it makes it easier to stick it into there and tighten it. So I'm going to stick the all thread through the hole and back into this hole which sits at the base of that spring retainer. And once you get it in place, with the double nut. You want to tighten this all thread down. Get the second one in first. Okay. As you can see, this one's just tightened in a thread. So I'm going to take this one all the way down so you can see how far this is going to go down. I have not released any spring tension right now. All I'm doing is inserting that, thread, that all thread rod into there. So you can see that goes down a little more than about a half an inch right there. So now I'll install the second all thread rod. That same depth. 
and make sure it bottoms out into, like that, into the recess on the bottom. Now, once I have that, I can take that first nut and <clears throat> I have to compress this spring evenly. In other words, I can't just take one nut and turn it all the way down and then take the other one down. So what I have to do is this process. One thread, one thread, one thread, one thread. So you keep moving this down until the check assembly comes off of the bottom. That's a little bit of lapse photography because I've tightened that all the way down. Approximately 10 to 12 half turns. And once I've taken it down that far, make sure your lock nuts stay here. That keeps the security of that all thread on there. But what you should see now is you should see a gap between the disc holder and the seat. What that allows to do now is that this disc holder can actually be unscrewed off the back of the check stem. Now it will be a little tighter than that. I had this loosened up for demonstration reasons. You may have to put that onto a white vise to get that loose. I'll show you how that check mechanism works. So there the spring is in a controlled fashion right now. There's my check seat. I'll put that on the side for now. And I have my disc holder now. When we were talking about the double check, this one, remember I had it apart and I said all I have to do is unscrew this plate. Well, here's that plate and I want to show you this one so you know how it goes on back on the other one. I mentioned that the uh, retainer clip from the, the fabricated steel body fits right in. Now, by unscrewing that disc retainer plate, it will come out. On the RP version, there will be a stainless steel backing plate and there will be a bolt that fits in a hex right here. On the double check version, all you have is this. But on the RP version, there's an additional bolt here. And then here's the actual disc that can come out of the disc holder. Unlike the two and a half through six inch, again, the discs uh, can be repaired on the eight and ten inch, replaced on the eight and ten inch. On the other two and a half through six, you have to replace the entire uh, check assembly. Discs are directional, it goes one way. You can see it's molded on the back side and flat on the front side. So go ahead and replace your disc. First check, you'll be putting this bolt back in. This plate, which is on there for strength. Go ahead and tighten the disc retainer. Have that very tight. Go ahead and get our spring mechanism, which still has the spring contained in it. We're going to go tighten up. You want to get that very tight. Good idea to put it on the vise. Once you get it to there, once it's tightened up, now we have the disc replaced. Now we can release our spring. After you've loosened <coughs> those nuts, approximately 12 half turns. Again, here's where the double nut comes into play. Tighten those two nuts into each other. Like that. Like that. Then the thread. All thread rod can be removed. Once the all thread rods are removed, <coughs> O-ring slot sits right here, it holds the check into the body. Putting it back in the body, it's bolted in. These bolt holes, again, make sure it's tightened in uh, equally so you don't have one side tipped to the other, make it so that it won't seal. 
It is an O-ring seal, so it doesn't have to be overly tight, but it does have to be tight evenly for a proper repair. So that's the 8-inch 4000 SS. That was the first check. That would be the second check. Or this would be the check that you would find in the double check assemblies of the 4000 SS. In talking about the Ames stainless steel body generation, we're talking about the 2000 SS, the SE versions, the 4000, 3000, 5000 SS. We've gone through the 2.5 through the 12 inch and the 10 inch sizes on the larger ones. Now I want to talk about the smaller sizes, meaning 3 quarters through 2. Kind of an obscure model, not a whole lot of them sold, and I'm not sure how many are left out there. There are still repair parts available for them, but I want to go through them quickly showing you what they look like. Here's the 4000 SS version. This happens to be a 3 quarter inch. Here's the 2000 SS in a 1 inch version, double check. This is a 2.5 inch SE. Remember the SE version, that means it's got the 2 inch check assembly. So that puts it in the realm of the small sizes. Even though it's a 2.5 inch body, it has 2 inch check parts inside of it. So the checks are similar in the double check and the RP, so I'll just go ahead and take the RP version apart to show you how it works. Relief valve sensing line is external. Two compression nuts will remove the stainless steel the tubing from the body. Once I've removed the body, I mean the relief valve sensing line, there's a single access bolt on the top. Go ahead and remove that bolt. That will loosen your relief valve body from the bottom. Relief valve body will come out in one piece once you loosen that bolt. Sealed by an O-ring here, so it should be hand tight, as I've mentioned many times. Once I've got the relief valve cover, um, the relief valve body off, the cover comes off in one piece. It is directional. There's an arrow showing the direction of flow of water, also showing how it goes back together. If you'll notice that these little recesses in here happen to correspond right where the recesses for the check valves are. Once I've got the cover off, I have to remove the second check first. If I try to remove the first check, it won't come out. I need the access of this area to get the sex. So the second check has to come out first like this, and then the first check comes out second. See, it's a little bit longer body. The check assemblies are sealed by an O-ring in the middle. There's the O-ring that sits right there like this, so it slides into the body. Now, one of the problems with stainless steel tubing is, as the name implies, it's strictly tubing. You can see how the body was extruded, meaning it was stretched out to make this hole inside there. Since this is an O-ring seal on this check assembly, if we have any problems, like let's say uh, thermal expansion, or we have a problem with uh, pumps putting in a large shock in there, it is possible to stretch that tubing. If that tubing stretches to the point where that O-ring will not seal inside that assembly, you have to replace the entire assembly. In other words, as long as that O-ring can be squeezed in that slot, and that slot can squeeze inside the body right there, this is a perfectly good check assembly. But the day that this tubing stretches out of around, or somebody puts a pipe wrench on it, or some other configuration like that where we have a problem where suddenly this O-ring doesn't seal the, on the body, then we do have to replace the entire body. Check assemblies come out in one piece. Just, just like on the SS design, you're going to replace the entire check assembly. You're not going to rebuild these checks, first check and second check. As you can see, they don't go back in back this way because if you do, you can't get them back in and the cover won't go on. They're also marked on the top where it says first check and it says second check in, in large letters. So reassembling is just going to be the reverse. First check in first, second check in second. On the check assemblies. Let's talk about the relief valve now. It looks similar to the relief valve we saw on the SS. The cover is plastic. It is not bolted, but it is actually threaded. So go ahead and unscrew the relief valve cover. The stem will come out in one piece after this. And my relief valve spring. Relief valve stem. This is what you get in the relief valve repair kit is that entire stem assembly. So you replace the entire relief valve stem through the entire replacement. Rebuilding is going to be just the reverse, placing the spring in the middle. The relief valve stem has to go into the cover first. The guide holes right here. It's important we line that up and then get your rolling diaphragm all the way around the lip. Make sure it has its rolling right here. Now we have to catch that relief valve spring in the center where that bolt is. So hold it till it goes in place. Check through the relief valve area that it's in straight. Then go ahead and tighten your relief valve cover. Now you're ready to reassemble. Having your cover, making sure you're going the direction of the arrow. That way, this lines up here. If you see we line it up like that, it's going to be slightly off. So we want to line this up. There's an O-ring seal. The O-ring sits right in here on the cover. You'll replace that O-ring when you rebuild it. 
Reassembly is going to be just getting the cover in place first, which holds the checks. That retainer keeps the two checks in here. Now I can catch my relief valve body from the bottom. Once I get the O-ring seal right here, up here by hand tight, like that. Now I take my bolt and quarter turn on my bolt. Will allow me to tighten that O-ring and load the O-ring so it properly loads that O-ring. And that's how you're going to rebuild on the small sizes, meaning three-quarter through two.